All right, I hope you all enjoyed the granola bars and um, coffee. And I feel again like I should make the plug and say thank you to the School of Social Work that um, allowed us a modest fund of money to be able to um, buy snacks. We have lunch available for you later um, at the next break. Um, and we're really grateful that they afforded us just a tiny bit of money to be able to provide that for you. So we're getting ready for our next session, um, which is a panel of folks that some of you may be familiar with and others you might not be so familiar with. But since the purpose of this conference is to think about ways that we can do things differently, and one of the things that Tamara said is thinking about going upstream and working with those people who are upstream to try and keep the problem from happening, we thought that the way to best address that is through advocacy. So what we have today is a group of individuals who in their own right are doing advocacy in very diverse styles and very diverse ways. And I think each of us, when we think about advocacy and what we can do comfortably, it looks very different. So I'll start by introducing the panel and the moderator. And then after that, the moderator will um, be here and pose questions to the panel, and then afterwards there'll be a few minutes to ask questions. If any of you have questions, you're given some note cards to write questions on, just raise your hand, and Latifa, who's in the back, will um, pick them up, and then we'll have the panel address some of those questions. So Bishop Harold Rayford um, is a moderator. He has a BA in Business Administration. He is the pastor, uh, Faith, Hope, and Love Family Church in Sun Prairie. He is a president of the African American Council of Churches of Greater Madison. He is the chairman of the Minnesota, Wisconsin, Dakota District of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. He is a bishop to over 100 churches in Haiti, married to Jackie Rayford for 28 years, and is a parent and a grandparent. For our speakers, in no specific order, we have Matthew Bronjan, 2008 grad graduate of Purdue in, with a degree in political science. He is currently an organizer for Young, Gifted, and Black Coalition. He is a fellow of the New Leaders Council, team member of United Way of Dane County Community Solutions Team, campaign, and a campaign worker of the 2008 presidential campaign of Barack Obama. Next we have Mr. Andre Johnson, who is a certified social worker and graduate of UW-Madison. He is the juvenile justice manager, Dane County Department of Human Services, and has been working in that capacity since 2014. Prior to that, for 15 years, was a supervisor of Dane County Neighborhood Intervention Program. Before that, for 24 years, worked with youth in Dane County, um, and is a proud father of two UW-Madison students and a Packer and Badger. Your fan. <laughs> Mr. Michael Johnson has an MBA from the University of Phoenix, is a CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of Dane County, is a community leader in youth development, is a board member of the Kaplan Family Charities, Overture Center, a Grace Hospice, Great Lakes Higher Education Corporation, Board of Visitors for the School of Human Ecology, and the Mortgage Center. Last but not least, we have Rachel Krinsky, who is a licensed social worker, an MSW, and a graduate of the University of Utah. I didn't know that. I graduated from the University of Utah with my MSW. Um, is the executive director of the YWCA. For 12 years, was the executive director of the Road Home, um, Road Home Day in Dane County. Prior to that, her work included family and school counseling at Brer Patch and counseling and case management to people with HIV and AIDS. With that, I welcome the moderator, Bishop Rayford. So first of all, I want to say to all of you, thank you. Thank you for everything that you have done everything that you are doing, and everything that you're going to do. Um, as a pastor, uh, in my profession, we are taught that our occupation and our vocation are not selected by us, but they are selected for us. Uh, they choose us. And I believe that's something that, that we have in common. Uh, and, and I would suggest that 
the best social workers see uh, your job as a calling. Uh, and, and there will be times that you will question your sanity. You, you will say to yourself, I could do much better. I could make more money working less hours, especially once you become emotionally engaged. But then you'll meet that one kid, that one family. You'll meet my nephew, my niece, my church member, and they will move you and they will charm you and they will remind you of why you chose this profession. So I ask that you not give up, uh, that you not give up on our children uh, because you will see the best of us and you will see the worst of us. And I believe that you are more important than any politician, than any police officer. You are more important. You are right up there with the family. You are the new extended family. And you have to protect those who can't protect themselves, shield those who can't shield themselves, and you will hear and participate in horror stories uh, in ways that you won't even be able to talk about at home. So again, I ask you uh, not to give up. And the fact that you're here today and you're listening to this dialogue and you're exposing yourself to, to, to knowledge and information and you're learning uh, history and you're, you're hearing perspectives uh, that uh, you would not have heard anywhere else. Listening to Percy Brown talk about uh, uh, Mississippi and, and, and compare it to Wisconsin, uh, for me and for you, I'm sure, has given you a new look or new view of uh, the race to equity uh, report and study uh, that we are all uh, dealing with. And I had a piece of paper up here uh, with my questions. I think it's underneath yours. Thank you. And so we are, uh, we're here today uh, in my Richard Pryor voice. We're gathered here today. <laughs> we're gathered here today to talk about, no, seriously. There was a time that you could do a Bill Cosby uh, voice, but you can't do that anymore. <laughs> Bill's out. Richard's in, Bill's out. All right. Um, so I want to, uh, we have a great, a great uh, panel here um, of experts, of people that are uh, not new to the front lines, but are on the front lines. And I, I just want to ask a few questions, and I'm going to ask uh, that you uh, try to limit your response uh, to three to five minutes. Uh, so the first question, and I'm going to pose this question to Matt. Uh, and that question is, how would you describe your mode of advocacy? And Matt, after you, everybody just come down, come down the line after Matt, Rachel will be next, and then Michael, and then Andre. All right. Um, Young, Gifted, and Black's form of advocacy is direct action. Um, our main mode is to disrupt the way things are, um, whether that be, I'm sure you all heard about the, the mayoral forum um, debate at, uh, off Willie Street at the, what was it, Barrymore. And uh, a lot of people are upset at us that we disrupted the debate of what we saw BS answers. Um, we want to change and force a conversation away um, from what it has been to what it needs to be, um, whether that's calling truth to power, calling things what it is, uh, such as we live in a white supremacist country, um, especially as Percy was saying earlier, this country was built for white men by white men, um, at least the wealth uh, was gathered by white men and, and robbed um, black wealth and black bodies. Um, and that has continued on through our history uh, up to today. Think of a time in history, in the United States history, when that has not happened. When has that not happened? Um, when we gained, when we had marginal gains in 1960s and 70s, we launched the war on drugs, there was ghettoization uh, projects. We didn't lose our racist leaders, they were still in power. Um, so our, our is, is really direct action and, and being the voice of the voiceless. Um, and that is, that is big, something that 
we do is we listen. And a lot of things that, that, that you might not see in the papers are the many community forums, community gatherings, community educational sessions that we hold. We talk, we listen to people, we talk, we listen to communities. Uh, we talk what we're about, we read our history, we know where we came from, and we give a voice to that, whether it's pounding on the streets or interrupting the order of things. The way we see it, if it's an order that doesn't have humanity or justice, it is not an order that is for us. Uh, so we want to frame that discussion, shape the discussion, and push it in a direction um, that, that forces the hard truths that we must face if we, this country is to truly move forward, and that is to force a reckoning of our past, that is force a reckoning of the destruction that this country has brought upon ourselves and, and the world. All right, thank you. Uh, next, Rachel, same question, and everybody will answer this question. I'm just going to restate it. How would you describe your mode of advocacy? I think that my mode and the mode of the YWCA is a combination of education and um, urging people to move towards what ought to be better. Um, and I would also say that our mode has changed a little bit in the last couple of years because until two years ago in this community, the YWCA was mostly crying out into the darkness, trying to get people to talk about race at all. Um, now that it's become politically correct and very important that everybody talk about race in this community, <laughs> our, um, our movements have changed a little bit. So for many years, 10, 15 years, we've been doing the education piece just trying to help people understand what racism is, what structural racism is, how we got to where we are, um, trying to help the white people get over ourselves. It's a big piece of work. Um, how to understand that when you talk about privilege, that doesn't mean that we're saying your granddaddy didn't work for what you have. It means we're saying my grandparents worked really hard and other people's grandparents worked really hard and it didn't produce the same results, et cetera. So we've been doing a lot of that education. Now that this community is feeling this pressure and embarrassment and um, some other stuff going on, we, we have another role that's been emerging, which is giving people and organizations tools and pathways to move towards equitability, um, challenging them to do so, outlining what each white person needs to do and what primarily white-led organizations need to do, offering both the tools and the push. Um, I think that if I were gonna name a goal for our brand of advocacy, we're trying to change political will. Um, there's been a really exciting change in this country that we've all gotten to see, which is unusual for it to go that fast around gay marriage, and how quickly public opinion and thus policy and many things have suddenly moved after many years of non-movement. I think we are trying to get that kind of shift in public understanding and public commitment to change. And in Madison, Wisconsin particularly, so much of that is getting past this business about I'm not a racist, so that we can work for solutions. And I, I really do wanna ask those of us who are white in the audience this question. So if someone says to me that I'm a racist, so what? Do I die? Does everybody stop speaking to me? Can I no longer feed my children? <coughs> Really, so what? Get over it. I mean, that, that's, a, that's an individual level change. I do stuff, I trip over in public, doing this work, you're gonna make mistakes, and people will say to me, that thing you said or that thing you allowed to happen, or people will say to me straight up, YWCA is racist. And when that happens, I don't go into that white people thing about, well, no, no, we didn't mean it that way. I stop and I ask some more questions and I listen. And it doesn't mean that I have to believe that my core being is racist and that what I'm doing is no good. And it doesn't mean I have to believe that everything sucks about the YWCA. But if I can listen and I can learn and I can own whatever piece it is, or even if I disagree and I continue to do the work I'm doing, I am not gonna spend my time and my energy and my advocacy efforts debating about whether I or my organization or anyone else is racist because that doesn't do anything. And this happens for people, individual level, but it also happens for organizations and it happens for systems. The more time we spend arguing about whether something is or is not racist, the more time we are not moving the needle on the disparities and on the things that have to change. And so I think this education about what we can change, where it came from, what the policies were, 
and then making decisions and helping other people make decisions to move towards equity by doing actual things, behavioral strategic movement. That's what we're about. All right, Michael. So I would say um, at Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, our mode of advocacy is similar to the YWCA. Um, our, ours is education, empowerment, and then I would say as a, one of many leaders um, in the African American community, I would probably consider myself a, a bridge builder. Uh, there's all kinds of challenges that's taking place right here um, in this community. And I think many of us live in a, bu a bubble. Some of us live um, in our own neighborhoods and don't really understand the challenges that young people and families face in this community. Um, it hurts to my core to see a city that, have, that has a uh, population of African Americans, that's 5%, but yet 44% of the inmates that's in our uh, Dane County Jail are men that look like me. Uh, we have truly created a prison, a school to prison pipeline right here um, in this community. And so when you look at the suspension rates, when you look at graduation rates, when you look at the unemployment uh, disparities, uh, these are issues that we have to fix um, in our community. So we've tried to lead by being an example, uh, by providing goodwill, but at the same time, by delivering results for kids. So in our agency, we committed to saying, we have one goal at Boys and Girls Club, and we call it a BHAG. A BHAG is an acronym for Big Hairy Audacious Goal. And our Big Hairy Audacious Goal is that we want 90% of our kids to graduate from high school and be prepared for college or career. So if we're going to end poverty, we have to educate our kids, get them to graduate from high school, but at the same time, this community got to be willing to hire them. We live in a community where um, you walk into some of these companies and you see three, 400 employees and you won't see one person of color in a leadership role. You won't see a person of color in a mid-management role. And sometimes you may see somebody at a lower level role. And then I'll hear folks say, well, why can't we hire folks of color? And if you really wanted to, you could. And, and folks choose not to. And so if we're going to uh, resolve some of these issues, you have to deal with the economics around it. And I think that's what's really hurting young people and families in our community. So we have tried to advocate by bringing the spotlight to some of those issues. We live in a community where the average age of a homeless person is eight years old. And so while we tout on one hand, we're one of the best cities in America, we're the fourth safest city in the United States, there's 51 campsites where people are living in the woods and below zero temperature weather, and we as a community allow that to happen. And so as social workers, as advocates for young people and families, uh, your, your support is going to be needed uh, from these young people, and from their families, and they're gonna need you as personal advocates to advocate um, for their well being. Right? Andre? That three to five minutes for me, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, I wanna uh, thank Percy and uh, Tamara for getting up and telling a little bit of their story of growing up in Madison. And I'm gonna take about one of those five minutes. Uh, to talk about mine. Uh, Percy was a little bit wrong on one of his points that I, I told, him, <laughs> told him about um, afterwards. Um, I grew up in Madison as well. Um, actually, Percy and my dad uh, are frat brothers and uh, came up from Mississippi uh, together. Um, but actually, Lincoln was a middle school here in town. And in 1980, um, because of federal... Uh, regulations and uh, too high of a concentration of African American youth in particular, uh, which didn't match the city makeup, Lincoln was closed down. And the first busing in Madison took place, which was busing of black kids out of South Madison to three different middle schools, Senate, uh, the, the then Van Huys and Cherokee. So a step prior to that, um, th there was the, the busing of people out. Um, 
but in the five or six or seven years after that, it, it didn't correct the issue. And the conversations too frequently, I think, were about the wrong piece of neighborhood school or integrated school rather than an integrated neighborhood school. Um, and so that's part of our problem and issue is it's still a very segregated um, community and society. I don't know what you'd call my approach, but I guess, you know, working from within. Um, uh, when I uh, left, I was a West High grad as well, grew up in South Madison, went to UW, and number one, swore I would never stay here um, because of uh, the experiences that you, you have as an African American growing up in this town. Um, I did stay. Um, for the, for college and swear I would never stay after that. I stayed after that. <laughs> um, I've raised my kids here and I've questioned that, um, honestly, um, whether that was uh, a selfish choice uh, to do that. Um, they're both here at UW and I'm pretty confident they will not stay here in this town. Um, and, and that's problematic um, if you have people that um, do not want to stay here, do not want to come here. Um, so that, has, that was my one minute. Um, but I don't know what I'd call my style or approach, but first of all, I, I want to just own something. I work for the county. Um, I'm our juvenile justice manager. We have a, we have a problem. Um, we've had a problem since before um, I entered our system, um, and I'm committed to impacting that problem. The schools have a problem. Uh, the city has a problem. Um, and that's, I think, the first thing that we have to do is we have to own our problem. Um, we're not doing a good job with a big segment of, of the people we're charged with serving. And uh, it's our fault. So that's the first thing, is taking responsibility. Um, now what are we going to do about it? Um, Clean Care's got a, a good idea of starting young. Um, one City uh, Learning Center, um, we have African American kids entering our schools behind. Um, and so one piece of, of a strategy of what we can do is start early. Advocate for birth to three. Um, there's a lot of research around um, engaging uh, youth and families um, at that early age um, to have effects. We see from third grade reading levels as being a predictor of future involvement in our system. We need to target that. Um, schools have to do a better job. I see Tarika sitting over there. Uh, she's spearheading a, a committee that we're involved with and we've been working much closer with MMSD over the last year or two than we ever have in my career. Um, we've got to come together. Uh, we can't be offended. Uh, by uh, people saying that we're not doing a good job, because we're not. Um, we can't continue to do what we've always done because we're going to get what we've always got. So it's time for changes. Um, my dedicated you know, mission is to keep kids away from me and from our system because uh, we don't do a good job. So YWCA, you know, some different grants, uh, we're looking at literally keeping kids away from our system, um, engaging them in restorative practices where community members um, and others are involved, changing the way we think about our kids, changing the way we engage our kids, changing the way we help them attach to the positive things uh, that exist for some in the community, but not all. Um, and those are the first steps uh, to us making a change in this. So. I guess my approach and, and hopefully the county's is to look at what our role is in that, um, own that we're not or haven't done a good job, um, and look at different ways to move forward, to collaborate with others, um, to do things different, and recommitting resources to things that are effective, using data to drive our decisions, not just who we like or who uh, has always gotten contracts. We need to uh, use things that are effective, and that, that may mean shaking things up. Um, so I guess that's close to my five minutes, so I'll, I'll stop there. So I guess a, a 
if I was going to call it anything, it's a, a collaborative approach where we own and take responsibility for our faults um, as the first step to moving forward. I think that as, as we listen to all of these uh, approaches, you will notice how different they are. And one of the things that has stuck out in my mind is that no one approach has worked independent of the others, that there's no one approach that will solve uh, all of our issues, but each one has its merit, whether it's forcing change, whether it's educating um, or, or equipping people with the tools they need uh, to make uh, better decisions, whether it is uh, building bridges for the children, whether it's having those audacious goals of getting our kids out of uh, out of high school so that they can get better jobs or getting those that are hiring to hire uh, 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 our children, uh, and I'm talking about African-American children, or whether it's working from within uh, to change how we see uh, our children, we do have to do a, a, a better job. And it's good to know that we have in this community these four, at least four approaches. Uh, and, and it's good to know that everybody that's at this table really has the same goal. They're all trying to make life better for the kids that are in our community. Um, and, and I think they're going about it different ways, but that is so important. Let me go to the next question. Um, and I'll start back with you, um, Andre. What would you say are the strategic <coughs> advantages to your approach of advocacy? Done. Um, uh, <laughs> um, it, it, you can't just have one approach. Um, so I don't think, I don't think one is, is more important than the other. We have to have all of them. Um, and there's probably, you know, for the four of us that are sitting up here, there's probably 10 other approaches. And we, we need every approach. We need all hands on deck. Um, mine, if you're, if you're talking about, I work within government. And uh, government has a role, but government also um, <laughs> has a way of doing things. Um, so I, I think we're one piece of a very big puzzle um, that's turned upside down and we don't see the picture that we're putting together. Um, so we have to work together. Uh, we have to find ways to uh, you know, engage each other uh, across systems, not operate in our own silos. Um, and the, the one piece that, that I would add to the table is we have to ask the people that are affected. Um, how can we help? How can we be a part of the solution? Too often we, we think we have the answers, and I'll be the first one to say we, we don't. Um, we're stumbling in the dark like everybody else. Um, but I'd rather stumble in the dark together because uh, we have more of a chance to, to find the door um, and shed some light on, on this issue and move forward. But we have to engage the people that are being affected by this day in and day out. And we have to hear them, truly hear them, and listen to what they say and not question or justify or take offense to what may be uncomfortable. Um, because they may say, you know what, the county hasn't helped me one bit. And we need to hear that. And we need to hear not only what we could have done or should have done, or how we could have done it differently, or how we could have engaged them in a different way. Um, we can't discount their experience just because it may not be ours. Um, their experience is valid. My experience is valid. Everybody's experience in this room is valid, but some people, uh, are facing things that affect their lives on a daily basis that's hard for, for people to wrap their heads around. So Andre, let me ask you a question. You talked mm -hmm. about discounting um, someone's experience. What, what do you mean by that? We can't discount someone's experience. When somebody tells you this, this is what's going on, this is what's happening, this is what's happened to me, um, I've, I've had the, the fortune of, of talking to different people over the years and will say, while on campus, I was probably pulled over 20 or 30 times on my scooter. 
Um, and the first response is, well, what were you doing? What did you do? Um, I was a, a black man on a, on a scooter, a little spree. If you all know what the size of a spree, I'm a big guy. Um, yeah. Well, they can only go about, <laughs> about 25 miles an hour. Get on a um, motorcycle. Downhill with a brisk wind. Um, <laughs> and the, the excuse was always, uh, you were speeding, speeding, really. Um, and, and, you know, I, I could have reacted in a different way. I was angry and I was upset. Um, fortunately for, for me, I didn't react in that way, but I would use different moments to, to try to educate and say, come on, I mean, we know why you pulled, pulled over. There's a rash of sprees being stolen on campus. I don't match your description of what you think a college student is, so you think I stole the spree. Um, but others that you may tell that story to, will discount that as, oh, that, that didn't really happen, you're exaggerating. Um, so they're discounting what, what I know to be my life experience. And others experience that on a daily basis. And so we need to validate what, what people say. We need to listen, truly listen. Um, and try to understand, because we can't truly understand, but try to understand the impact that that may have on them. And imagine for a moment the world and the experiences that, that others that may be different than us may have to deal with on a daily basis just going about their day-to-day -day lives. Okay, Michael, what would you say are the advantages, the strategic advantages of your uh, approach? I'll say one thing, you won't see me on a moped. <laughs> I'm sure the mopeds are happy to hear that. <laughs> um, I would say that um, I move at a very, very uh, fast pace. Um, somebody once told me that um, if you're passionate about what you do, um, you'll never work a day in your life. And um, there's some issues in this community that uh, that I'm passionate about that goes beyond the scope um, of Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, so I'm really, really good at planning. Uh, I'm really, really good at putting together uh, communication plans. Um, I'm really, really good at raising money uh, for critical issues for young people and families uh, in their community, in, in the community. And I'll, I'll give one example. I remember uh, about two years ago, there was a mother that walked in our Boys and Girls Club, and uh, she had moved here from a suburb in Chicago, and there was a, a domestic um, violence um, situation. And they were sleeping, and uh, her and her two kids were sleeping in the parking lot at Mount Zion Church. So she knew that we fed the kids every day at the Boys and Girls Club, signed her kids up. So it was one of the kids who had told one of our staff that they were sleeping in this truck. And she came in looking for help, and I really didn't know what to do. I just didn't know what to do. Um, I said, well, did you check this place? And she said, Mr. Johnson, everybody says that. I'm trying to find help for my kids tonight. And I walked away crying because I did not know how to help her. So I went home, and it was on my conscience all night. So I went to the parking lot, and off good faith, I said, I'm just going to put them in a hotel and try to figure something out. So then we uh, set up a basic need fund so when families have these, have these kinds of issues that we can get them temporary support until um, they get the help that they need. That then forced me, um, as the CEO of Boys and Girls Clubs, I said, I want, even though I grew up in poverty, I grew up in the projects in Chicago, stayed in, those high-rise buildings. I'm um, 39 years old, so I stayed in the projects until I was 25. Uh, but I've been removed from it for a few years. So I wanted to experience homelessness from the lens of a homeless person. So I decided to uh, go homeless for three days. And my strategy was clear. I wanted, I wanted to bring somebody who did that kind of work. So I brought Will Green. But I also wanted to bring a white business uh, person with me who was well respected in this, this community so we can appeal to the conscience of folks who are not touched by this every day. So uh, we got a lot of uh, attention around this issue 
And then we ended up finding this, um, this young lady who was sleeping in a parking lot at Walmart. And this young lady had lost her apartment. Uh, she worked for a company that had changed her shift and said, we want you to work the second shift. She said, I can't work the second shift. I got four kids. So she said, I've been at this place for 10 years. There's no way I'm not going to be able to find another job. So uh, she quit. After a year and a half, she couldn't find a job. She lost her apartment. For almost two years, she bounced from house to house. And then two years later, she finds herself sleeping in a parking lot at, um, in Walmart. So we decided that we wanted to advocate on her behalf. So what we did, we partnered with some, some other groups. We had a company to fully furnish our apartment. We got her a full-time job. We didn't necessarily give her a hand out. We gave her a hand up. And, uh, and sometimes advocacy, you have to step from behind your desk and make sure that you're in touch with those who are impacted. And so when you think about homelessness in this community, I remember sleeping in that homeless shelter downtown uh, one night. Most, I would say at least 30% of the people that was um, in that shelter actually had jobs. But because this city has one of the lowest vacancy rates in the country, if you have bad credit, if you don't have a job, guess what? You're not going to get an apartment here. And I remember one gentleman telling me, he said, I got $4,000 saved up, but because I had a felony from 1969, I can't get somebody to rent to me. And so, so I would say uh, in, res in response to approaches that anytime you're advocating for something, you have to have a good, um, uh, a good organizational plan. You got to have good um, messaging around um, your points and you got to build partnerships and collaborations to help you get an end result. You know, as you were talking, I was just thinking I could imagine uh, the, uh, the social workers in the room just envisioning yourselves in all of these various stages. You're talking about a family who's homeless, who doesn't have a job, and now they're moving from place to place, and, and you're trying to find them, and then you got the school, and what school are they in, and, and, and what are they eating, and, 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 and can you help, you know, now everybody's gonna try to find you, because you help the family now, they, they're like, hey, I got another family for you to help, you know, uh, but, but what you said is so profound that uh, everybody has to come uh, out from behind their desk and and turn their nameplate over and be willing to go the extra step because a lot of people are being turned away uh, uh, because of a policy or because of a rule or because of a you know we have reached our capacity and and you know as you were talking homelessness is an issue and I tell the people in my uh, that I talk to all the time uh, you're one eviction away from being homeless especially in Dane County, and especially if you're a minority. And you, you, you can't, I'm from Texas. You get evicted, you can move around in the apartment complex around the block. Um, but here, you, you get evicted, you're done. You, and you can't even move in with family because family isn't here. Uh, so when you talk about discounting, you know, uh, people's experience and stereotyping, you know, you're homeless, you must have done something wrong. It really does take a, a lot of, uh, of care and compassion, which kind of leads me uh, to Rachel. Uh, not that we're going to change the subject to uh, uh, homelessness, but I know that you deal uh, extensively with that. How does your approach of, of educating and providing tools to people, what strategic advantages do you have uh, with that approach? I'm going to answer this in a few ways, and I just want to start in a place that I often go to, which is the strategic advantage of being me um, as a white person. And I think owning who you are in the work is incredibly important. Um, and just to share, I also grew up here, and I also graduated from West High School, like some of the other people you've heard from today, and I had a different experience growing up here and going to West High School. And when I go out to talk to the community about these issues, I have a different experience. Nobody calls me angry. I can say whatever I want, and I can say it however I want, 
and people will not say that I'm angry because I am not an angry fill in the blank. I am not a black woman, I am not Latina, I'm, not a, I'm certainly not a black man, I'm not a native, you know, I'm not, I am not a person of color, which means that my ability to speak to these issues and be heard by other white people is a completely different experience, and that's a strategic advantage. That's a place where my privilege can be used for the good. So, that's one. I think another strategic advantage at the YWCA is that we do work at multi-levels. So we are, like Michael, working with homeless families and homeless individuals and people who need jobs and people who need rides to get to those jobs. We're, we're doing all of that work, but we're also working at the systems change level um, by offering, again, tools and education, by writing letters to the editor, by talking to our elected officials, by talking to other people who are in charge of things. So we're always sort of doing this dual or multi-level advocacy, and I think that's very important strategically, particularly because when we are talking about the social change piece, we have right with us the stories and the people who are being affected by those social inequities. Um, so when I'm talking about homelessness, and I'm talking about it as a racial justice issue, people in this community know that I also know from what I'm talking, because I've done the work with people. Um, I think another advantage to the way that we approach things is that we do start from this place of talking about ourselves, modeling ourselves. Um, when we, we have this program that I may talk about later called Creating Equitable Organizations. It's a really deep strategic change tool for organizations to move towards equity. We were the first clients of the YWCA, and we are in a deep change process at the YWCA because we are not going to go to our other clients. We've worked with Unity. We've worked with the Willie Street Co-op. We've worked with the Madison Police Department. We've worked with these other folks. We're not going to go there and say, hey, y'all should become more equitable if we haven't been doing the work and continue to do the work. And it is not easy work. And so when I'm talking to people about doing this work and I'm talking to another CEO, I can talk about how hard and painful this has been and still will be and maybe this week for me and how challenging it is and the fact that I'm still standing here doing it. That's a very important strategy. <coughs> Our work is very thoughtful. Um, we, we both give people that vulnerability but then also challenge them. So it's, it's kind of a pull and push and it says we're in it together. Um, we really try to call people in. That's one of our favorite phrases at the YWCA. Um, there's a philosophy about doing this work that says you want to be soft on people but hard on systems. That's where we're coming from. Individual people, we don't want to rail at, make them feel bad, call them names, strike up all that guilt and have people freeze up and go home. We want to call people in. Um, another thing we heard recently that we liked at a, um, I can't remember the name of the woman who said it, but we'd rather have a troublesome ally than an enemy. And so we hold our allyships. I would rather work closely with all the people on this panel and all the other people in the community who mean business about making social change, even if I don't agree with every word they say or how they said it or how somebody reported that they said it. If we're all working towards the same goal, then I'd rather have a troublesome ally so that we are all working together towards the goal and towards the people who don't agree with us. Because let's not be confused there are people and organizations and systems in this community who are not working towards equity, who do not want more equity, who want to hold tight to the advantages they have and the way things are because it's working. So if we fall into scrapping with each other, that works beautifully for the people who like things just the way it is. And so I think a really important part of our strategy is that piece about being strategic in our relationships and being strategic and sort of keeping eyes on the prize. Um, the last thing I'll say, and, and we're going to be asked about disadvantages later, so this will come up. Um, but one of the other advantages to this thoughtful solution and the, and the way we do things is that we can have those subtleties and nuances. Um, I don't mean getting into semantics. I kind of hate that. But understanding some of the subtleties so that we're, we're, this is complex. Making social change around racial Justice issues and disparities, is not, it's not a quick solution. We would have done that already. We're not stupid people, any of us. So we, we would have fixed it if it was going to be easy. We really do try to understand the complexities, educate other people. Again, when we call people in, it's about helping people understand one more subtlety about how things work. And I just want to name one thing that's happening here today that happens a lot in Madison, which is that when people talk about race and they talk about racial disparities, we talk about black and white. And I want to be clear that 
there's a lot of other pieces and other populations affected by racial disparities. And we do need to talk about black and white a lot, and we do often. What is happening historically and currently to the African American black community is incredibly important. It is unique. It is not the same as everybody else. But let's also recognize that there are Latino populations here, there are Native American populations here, there are Hmong populations here. And when we talk about race, let's be clear what we're talking about. For us, um, I'd say we're not attached to any purse strings. Uh, we don't have to answer to the plutocracy at all, um, which is especially true for our uh, elected officials. Um, and especially difficult for our elected officials to, to speak truth to power inside the system and not have to suffer major consequences for that. Um, that is very difficult for them, not saying it's impossible, but extremely difficult. Uh, we are all volunteers. Um, so for the most part, and there's a, a slight disadvantage I'll get into, that we don't have any financial consequences because we are not putting any money into it. And we are not getting any money for what we're doing. Um, so I'm doing you really a job plus an extra 40 hours a week. Um, and, and I might disagree on the it's not work uh, part of it. <laughs> um, but that's a, 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 and that's very important for us. Um, we can speak our minds, we can speak our truth um, without having some of those consequences. Now there are other ones, again, that I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but we can approach it from the outside. We can call out the hypocrisy of, of our officials um, that claim they want justice, yet will sit and debate for three hours about new bike paths. Um, sorry if some of y'all you know, like to ride your bike, but you know, when we spend $3 million renovating our bike paths when we have people that are homeless, that is a problem. That's a major problem. Um, so we are able to speak to that and able to speak to what our priorities are as a city, community, state, country on what we invest in, what are our priorities. Um, we don't have the luxury of going home. We don't have the luxury of walking away. This is our life. And as we've seen with Tony Robinson, quite literally, our life. Um, we get to call it what it is. And that's very, very important in these hard conversations is being honest, truly honest about what we're facing. Um, we get to attack a, a, a system. Um, as great work as a lot of organizations do, they're not attacking the system. They're working with individuals. And when you save an individual, you're not necessarily addressing the system. I'm not saying individual work is not important. We need to do as much as we can in, in, in helping individuals. Uh, but we need to be honest about that at the same time. Saving a group, small group of individuals um, is not going to change a system. And I'm going to be quite honest, the system is not broken. It's not broken. It is fixed. It is quite purposeful the way it is fixed. It is set up this way, it was set up this way on purpose. Anybody tells you that it's broken, they are living in a lie. A lie they want to tell themselves because the truth is much more troubling than a broken system. So we get, have the ability to call it what it is. Okay, I want to just ask you a question. You talked about changing a system. G give, give, give us an example of a system and how you will approach changing a system. How much time do I have? <laughs> uh, um, changing a system. Um, that's a tough one, because you have to start somewhere. Uh, where YGB started, and, and I'll go with our, our really first thing, is our main campaign, our, our, our first one we started, which was build the people, not the jail. Um, it is very easy, we are conditioned to think that investing in incarceration is what we need to do because we have criminals that we need to lock up. We don't see it that way. Poverty is the crime. Not the kid that's 19 years old that his dad's in jail or doesn't know his dad or whatever the case is and his mom is uh, hooked on, on crack, that he's got to figure out a way to pay rent, 
that our education system failed him because he didn't have the teachers pushing him along, telling him he's smart, telling him he's capable, so we don't have the skills. He's 18, 19 years old, doesn't know what the hell to do. So he holds up a corner store, and he gets labeled a violent offender because he held up a, a corner store to make sure that his mom has something to eat. So we need to address that. Um, so what we did is we targeted the building, uh, the proposed renovations of $8 million to study if we need to renovate our jail. Granted, there are some safety issues, this, that, and the third, but if we keep saying that we need to do this because of safety, because it's not quite up to code, because it's not the, the forefront of, of jailing, the forefront of enslavement, then we need to put more money into it. We targeted that. We said no. Not a single dollar goes into the enslavement of our people. That money needs to go into our communities. That money needs to make sure that that person doesn't have to hold up a liquor store or a corner store. We have to make sure that that person that's released has good resources, has a home to live in because we don't have renters that will rent to them because they're released. So we've been putting a lot of pressure on our county board to say no. Now, it, 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 you don't stop the funding of a jail. That just doesn't happen. But we are very, very, very close. Now, we still have a bit of ways to go, and there's some stuff behind the scenes and some issues because some county board members don't see it as a way to go because that's how we're supposed to do it, and that's how it's done. We're saying, no, that's not how it's done. We need to do it a different way. So we are very, very close to a victory, and, and it's still a, a bit to go, and we're still fighting a lot behind the scenes to make sure that this proposed money for this new jail doesn't go towards a new jail, that it goes towards mental health facilities, mental health systems that are so much needed. When 55% of the people incarcerated in the United States are suffering from mental wellness issues, it is not an issue of crime, it's an issue of mental health. So we want to address that. So that's what we're talking about, attack, attacking systems. We want to break the mold, break our mindset, and say there are different ways, there are different ways to do this. We don't have to do the way that it's always been. Because that way that it's always been is clearly not working. And to just say that it is working if we double, triple, quadruple down on those efforts is a complete lie. So we want to put that money into community-led resources, rip it away from the idea of incarceration, because that is the so-called best thing to do, that's the thing that we need to do, because we can't have these so-called violent people running muck in our communities when they are just trying to keep the damn lights on. So, you know, I, I personally um, had to challenge myself to um, be exposed to that approach, uh, because that, that was not my lane. I'm, I'm part of an unofficial group called Old, Gifted, and Black. <laughs> I tried to name it Middle Age, Gifted, and Black, but my kids were like, no, if you're in it, it's Old, Gifted, and Black. But, but, but I was very uncomfortable. Very, can I just be transparent? Very uncomfortable with the approach, the, 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 the message, the tone of young, gifted, and black. And, and many, many are, many African-American leaders are because it's so different from uh, old, gifted, and black, if you will. Uh, but, but when you think about, when you listen to uh, uh, that view and, and you find yourself saying, you know, <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> So I think it's important. That's why I asked you to elaborate on what you mean by system, uh, because if, if, uh, if we're not careful, we will mislabel or misunderstand or we'll miss the point um, of, of the different approaches. You know? um, and so some people are more inspired to deal with another, or another group, uh, but it does provoke dialogue. And I think that that is uh, very important. Let's go to the next question. And I'm going to pose this question first to uh, Rachel. Uh, and then we'll go from Rachel to Michael. Uh, and then uh, uh, to Andre. And no, Rachel, Michael, and then back to Matt. And we'll close out the question with Andre. What would you say are some barriers that challenge your style of advocacy? Rachel, what do you see as a barrier? Well, I think 
going back to what I had just finished saying in the last question, we are a little subtle and we are a little nuanced. And that means that sometimes we are not as quick and we, don't, we aren't perceived as being as urgent as some people might like us to be. Um, sometimes our work is quiet, um, you know, around changing systems. We've been working with companies in town to change their systems, to change their hiring practices, their onboarding practices, how they promote people, um, really trying to make changes. And, and it's happening in getting people of color hired, promoted, not only hired at entry level jobs. This is about individual change for the person who's hired, but it's about system change for those companies and the way they do business. But that does not make headlines and that is not very fast, and it's not a giant sea change. And so there is always this balance we're having at the YWCA about patience. And when is patience strategic, and when is patience just cowardice? Um, when do we speak? Because what we're saying is usually too complex to say at the minute something happens, but if we wait to be really sure we've said it exactly right and it takes us a month, we've missed the moment. Um, so I, I think this is the challenge, is that what we're trying to do is very thoughtful and intelligent, but we also want to be brave, um, and we want to be out there, and we don't, we don't do sound bites well in this strategic approach. Excellent. Michael. So I would say um, I'm probably the exact opposite of Rachel. Um, um, we move very, very fast, and sometimes um, when issues happen in the community, we respond uh, quickly. Now, sometimes that makes you vulnerable um, as a leader. Uh, I'm the type of person that we have a lot of constituents. So when Matt talks about uh, corporations and supporters, well, Boys and Girls Clubs have about 40,000 donors. So when I go out there and advocate on an issue, there are some people who support me and there are some people who walk away. So uh, when these issues come up and when I speak on them, uh, we lose support, uh, but when you're a leader, leaders got to always feel uncomfortable. If you're not uh, moving the needle, if you're not speaking up on critical issues, you got to decide whether or not you're doing the right thing um, for your community. So sometimes that makes you vulnerable as a leader uh, when, you, uh, when you speak up. Um, some would probably argue, um, I consider myself a bridge builder. Um, so I will uh, have very tough conversations with people behind closed doors. I, would, I will challenge them. Uh, but my approach is probably different than some of their approaches at this table. Now, what I will say is that um, every approach that's at this table, if one of the legs fall off that stool, the entire stool falls off. And so all these different approaches are needed. But my approach, my personal approach is to try to meet hammer it out in the boardroom, then if you can't hammer it out, then you go to public debate with it. Um, so that's, the, uh, that's, that's my particular style. And sometimes that can be a, um, uh, a disadvantage to uh, who your critics may be. All right. Three. Oh, no, man. Bad. No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> disadvantage, well, there are many. Um, so what we have is we have people power, and that is the only power that we have. And we are going against some tremendously, both locally and, 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 and nationally, and, and at some point internationally powerful individuals. Um, right now we are trying to launch a UN uh, human rights investigation into the murder of Tony Robinson and to the growing <coughs> disparities of Dane County and Madison, Wisconsin. The United States just doesn't get investigated for human rights violations. Um, so what you see is a variety of tactics, and these are checkbook tactics that you can go all the way back to especially anybody fighting for black liberation. And no, we are not, we don't have liberty, we don't have freedom, we are still fighting for black liberation. Because um, again, the history of, the black, of black robbery of our bodies and wealth continues on through this day. So we're still fighting for our liberation. So what we have are cell tactics such as us holding a youth forum in the red gym and the mayor's office, calling the chancellor's office, saying that we are telling our youth to burn down the city. Which is an outright lie. 
We did not say that. We did not have talks of violence. We did not have anything like this going on. Or reporters constantly asking us, and I got labeled as agitated in my response to this question. Um, well, are you guys going to, uh, you know, are, are you guys going to be nonviolent? Are we going to be? Are we going to be nonviolent? Did we kill somebody? Did we? Have any of our actions been violent? Have we perpetrated violence upon an entire group of people? Are we setting up systems that force 75% of kids in our communities to live in poverty? Are we locking up individuals? Who's violent? Now that comes from a historic, again, a white supremacist lens in, in labeling particularly black activists as violent, as hostile, as divisive. MLK was labeled violent, hostile, and divisive. Now I'm not comparing ourselves to him at all, but we have to remember this. He was hated by much of America, particularly even black America at the time of his assassination. He called for reparations. Michael, uh, Martin Luther King would have been a radical, an extreme radical by today's standards. Yet we whitewashed him into this uh, 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 savior of, you know, colorblindness. There are disadvantages of having the, the media loving sensational news, looking at it through a white supremacist lens and asking us and labeling us as violent and hostile. Having a chief of police saying uh, uh, protesters going to the city county building were volatile, yelling kill the police, that did not happen, I was there. We walked into the city county building quiet. We have actual video of this, of walk, having us walk into the city county building quiet. Um, so there is this, this threat that we have to understand of black bodies being looked upon as violent, as hostile to the broader white community. This goes back hundreds and hundreds of years of us being the violent ones when we are the ones defending our livelihood. This country, I'm, I'm speaking from a, a switching perspective, from a white perspective, claimed independence in an extremely violent way. They fought for their freedom in an extremely violent way. They waged a war for their freedom. So how come we are being asked to be peaceful in the face of violence when the violence is being perpetrated upon us? I don't condemn or condone violence. I know where it comes from. It comes from not having a way to voice your complaints in a legal manner. I'm not going to condemn the people in Ferguson for lighting property on fire for their lives. What do we value, property or livelihood or humanity? That is the question. I'm not a violent person. I'm not going to go out and, and, and act violently. But what we do, again, have to understand the power at play here, the power of, uh, of people holding on to a system, <coughs> again, a white supremacist system that benefits them. It benefits you if you're sitting here in white. It does. And that is, it, you're losing your privilege. And that is something that, that's, that's hard to confront. So we, we are at an extreme disadvantage when we have to confront that. Some very powerful individuals that haven't lost their power, can be different people, but they haven't lost their power throughout history. And they hold a lot of power. And we saw that came to a crashing end in the civil rights movement when it came to some very questionable circumstances in the deaths of some of our leaders, such as King, such as Fred Hampton, who was straight up assassinated. He was assassinated. And there's some very questionable circumstances about the, the FBI's role in both Martin Luther King's assassination and Malcolm X's assassination. People that, that threatened the power structures, especially from outside the system. All right, Andre. OK. Um... I guess the number one thing I would say as a, a barrier to um, our style of advocacy or what we're trying to accomplish would be uh, mistrust uh, by the consumers and the people that, that we serve or we're, have been charged with serving um, over the years. Um, I think we have to find a way to engage in a productive dialogue. Um, and again, as I said earlier, take ownership for our past mistakes and the ways that, that we have gone about doing what we need to do. So 
Um, mistrust is a big piece. We've got to work through that. Um, also, historically, um, we've all operated in our own silos. And so being in those silos, you know, the schools may be doing something over here and the business community over here and nonprofits over here, and we're, we're all operating uh, within our own little world um, with our own little slice of the pie, but we, we, we haven't always historically worked well together. And so I think we have to find ways to bridge um, that gap um, and also bring in especially more private sector uh, businesses and faith-based uh, community and to, to be part of the solution. Um, and then I guess finally uh, a, a major uh, barrier I think is just perception. Um, and I'm gonna pick on the schools and I keep looking at Tarika because you know we, we sit on a couple, couple committees but um, our number one spot that, that kids enter our juvenile justice system is schools. Um, and African-American boys especially enter at a higher rate. That's their first experience and entree into the system. Um, and for things that historically uh, in our lifetime when we grew up uh, would have ended up maybe in the principal's office and a call back uh, to uh, your parents, which that was the real consequence. Um, a fight, um, disorderly conduct, which is our number one charge. That's the number one things uh, that, that kids come in. So I think perceptions and fear, and I, in looking at this, uh, white youth are perceived differently for the same behaviors that African American youth demonstrate. And if you're fearful of uh, someone even if you're not, you don't recognize that fear, you'll name that behavior. That he was doing this, he was cussing, he wasn't following directions, he wasn't doing this. But if I'm, if I'm not fearful of you, I, I may have different approaches uh, of how I'm gonna deal with you. Um, I may relegate it to uh, them needing help and services rather than them uh, being disruptive and needing police intervention. Um, and so I think, you know, that other barrier is also um, we have to check ourselves. We have to, to <coughs> look inside and examine um, the biases that we all have. Every one, of, every one of us has biases. Every one of us operates through the lenses of the experiences that we've had in our lifetime. And that, that helps dictate what our responses are going to be. And frequently we don't even understand or realize um, how and when we're making those, those different choices or those different decisions. And I guess finally, one other thing is, if, we, if and when we solve all of that, um, is access to services. And what I hear quite frequently in different meetings is, the only way to get that young person services was to arrest them or to get our, our system involved. And, and that, that's just a mistake that we're, we're, we've lost if, we, if we've got to arrest somebody to get them the help they need. Um, so one of the things that we've, we've committed and YWCA has been on, on board and some different grants is changing our system um, so that uh, a kid can access the services that they need through whichever door they may come. They don't have to come through the door of the juvenile justice system and go in front of a judge for him to order this kid to go do something. Let's provide those services to the kids without them having to be arrested to get it. So I think changing, the, the barrier in that is changing the way our systems feel they need to respond to access those services. So under some of the things we're changing, um, the way that services can be accessed and saying, you know, arrest and, and the court ordering it doesn't have to be the way that you get those services. And so I'm, I, I'm going to leverage all the services I have because I'm going to see them one way or the other. I'd rather see them where we're, we're meeting the needs and getting the services addressed without them coming in front of a judge, being arrested and going that route. Um, so I think reinvestment of funds. And then once you have demonstrated um, things that are effective, I think we have to reinvest in those programs that are, that are having positive outcomes. Um, you know, money is tight. You know, I, you know, I actually honestly think we, we have a wealth of resources. I talk to other 
uh, managers across the state. And the, the amount of resources that we have in Dane County is phenomenal when you compare it to, to other places. I just don't think we, we always uh, allocate those resources in the best way. And things that have been proven to be effective, we don't reinvest in those things in that same, same manner. And some of it, I'm not going to go as far as Tamara and pick on our governor, well, I guess I just did. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're likely not to get, you know, huge amounts of, of more money. But how we use it, how we collaborate, how we bring those funds together, um, and how we use outcome measures and different things to show what's effective and reinvest in those things that are having positive impacts. Um, we've got to work together. To change this. This isn't a school's problem. This isn't a nonprofit's problem. This isn't a community's or faith based or government problem. This is all of our problem. Um, and, you know, like the, the old we, weakest link, we're, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And, and right now, we have a lot of weak, weak links out there. And so, um, yeah, I think those are our major, major barriers. Can, can I add approach. to Andre's point for a second? Um, the point that he makes around those links being connected, that's a fundamental problem for this community. So we have more nonprofits on a per capita basis than um, any city in the United States. And uh, we're not all in line. So I think what we're missing is this grand plan where all of the nonprofits and the schools all align around uh, what these challenges are. And then to Andre's point, just like with any business plan, there's outcomes that need to come from that. So while you got everybody doing work here, work there, it's not aligned. So then there's some issues around resources. Some groups have more than others. And then those who are doing good work may not have the necessary resources they need to expand to help more kids. And I would say that our city and our region is big enough that we can get things done, but it's small and intimate enough that we still can get things done. And this is not, a, in my opinion, this is not uh, a Chicago, even a Chicago or a Philadelphia or a St. Louis. So even though our disparity rates are off the charts, uh, I believe with the resources that we have, if there was this grand plan in place with objectives that we all can line up behind, including our schools, our county, our city, our nonprofits, the philanthropic community, we could begin to move the needle on some of these issues. So, you know, that leads me to uh, my fourth question. And, and you were talking about we um, being able to move uh, the needle, uh, working together. Um, and uh, Andre talked about mistrust, about perceptions and about fears um, as it relates to uh, disadvantages. But we also see those same things playing out between the different approaches. Um, uh, and are there advantages or disadvantages to working together, uh, all of the various approaches? Because we do have four distinct uh, approaches represented on this panel. Uh, let's just focus on, on advantages, how we can, uh, and I'll, I'll throw this uh, to you, uh, Michael, um, well, I'll just throw it out there for everyone, and we'll get two responses, and then we have some questions from the floor that I want to get to. Um, uh, how, what are the advantages in your estimation? And I think I'll just be moderated for a moment and just ask Michael and Rachel to respond to this question. What are the advantages yeah, I, of I think, working together? Yeah, I think the advantages are, uh, are needed. So I think if you went with uh, my particular style, it may be effective in some situations, but in some situations it may not. So sometimes in the local media, people will try to uh, pit me uh, and my group against young, gifted, and black. And in, and in all reality, we all want the same thing. Our approaches are just very, very different. And, uh, and sometimes people will try to play us against each other and I think Rachel said it uh, very, very well. There are groups of people who benefit, who don't want to see these things changed. And so I think you have to have a multitude of different approaches. And if we don't work with one another, we'll be talking about these issues in 2065. 
Rachel? I have a whole lot to add. I think that we each have different capacities and abilities, and we need all of us. Um, the more we can avoid throwing each other under the bus, the more we're going to move this forward. And I think that's a really critical piece. Um, I do just want to say that all of us doing this work benefit tremendously from the risks and the loudness taken by young, gifted, and black, because they can do it. And some of the rest of us can't, or won't, or shouldn't, or it's not our strategic method. But I have to tell you that the work the YWCA is doing with organizations benefits from the work that Young, Gifted, and Black is doing in raising the issues loudly. Um, it may be that the police department, in part, wants to sit down with us and work on these things and have conversations with me offline um, because I'm not screaming, but because someone else is. Because if nobody is screaming, we have a problem. And so, I, you know, and I think you could take that to any pair of organizations. It's difficult sometimes to work together. We don't agree about everything, but I think this, this sense of mutual respect and benefit and all moving and wanting the same thing is really critically important. All right, I think that was an excellent point that you brought out. A lot of the dialogues that, that we are seeing is a result of a response to young, gifted, and black. Um, and <coughs> saying, well, you know, if you don't want to deal with Rachel, <laughs> you know, it, it, we'll come back here, come Rachel, let, let's, let's come, come back, come back, Michael, come back, come back, don't leave. <laughs> let's talk, uh, and 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 it does add uh, a different um, uh, aspect to it. Let me just uh, pose this question, uh, and I'll pose this to Matt. Um, how how can we begin? And this is from the floor. How how can we begin a discussion with someone? who feels that social justice is an exaggerated issue in order to help them realize how important social justice is? Um, that's a tough one, because personally, with those people, I just don't. Um, they're just not worth my time or effort. I'm not saying they're not worth anybody's time or effort. They're not worth my time or effort or energy, because it costs, it, the work I do, I was, um, it took me about two weeks to really shake the shock of Tony Robinson's murder. And I'm still, I still get very emotional when I talk about it. Um, and it's tough. It's such an emotional toll that when I talk with those people, I just want to crack them in the face. And, I, and I'm 100% honest about that. I, I want to break their jaw. Um, coming from my mom's a social worker, she's, she's I should know better ways to, uh, <laughs> but I, I take a little bit more after my father than her. Um, <laughs> granted, my hat, dad hasn't, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> I've just talked about those, some of those uh, tactics. Um, but it, it is an important conversation to have. And some of those is, is making those emotional connections, that one-on-one -on -one connection of, of having them figure out a time that, that they have might have been disadvantaged in their life. And you know, you don't want to just always throw data at people because that will shut people off. Numbers are important, data is important, but you also have to tie in those real life stories. Talk people through that you know the work that you, you're doing, you know, you know a family that's homeless. You work with a, a struggling family. You know, when they say, oh, you know, they're just not working hard enough. Well, talk about that one family you know, that mom that might be working two jobs to keep the lights on, put food on the table, but doesn't quite have enough to pay rent, so they have to go and sell weed on the side, put clothes on the back of their kids. Real story. I'm, I'm sure a lot of y'all know some similar types of situations. Bring that humanity into it. Um, it's a long road uh, to, to give people that it, it's more, that it's overblown. You know, give a historical context. Learn more about yourself so you can make the connections from something like the uh, uh, Bacon's Rebellion that had really in the United States the first uh, infusion of, 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 of race division between classes of, of poor whites and, and enslaved blacks that rose up together and then they split them. Draw that connection uh, to the 13th Amendment. Draw that connection um, of, of the 1960s into the new Jim Crow. Draw that connection to uh, a, a city builders that purposely built New York or, or, or Madison <coughs> of communities of color that uh, were built in such a way that, that weren't connected to the rest of the city resources. Very purposefully, 
built as that way. To make those connections, make those human connections. Um, it's, a, it's a tough road, and, and you're, some people are going to be more receptive than others. Um, but I encourage you all to, to have those conversations um, and, and to really just keep hammering it away at it. Under, and and, and have them, try to have them understand that they are living in a very different lens. They see the world in a different way through their own life experiences. And they understand the, way, the world through their own life experiences. And they know from their own life experiences that nobody can truly understand what their life is like because only they've lived it. All right. So, yeah, make we're, that connection. We're, we're, we're out of time. <laughs> no, no, I, I think you, you've, you've communicated it very clearly that uh, we do have to have uh, those conversations. And uh, our time is up. I just want to share with you um, uh, in response to that, uh, in, in my, my closing remarks, the question of why it's important to have conversations. I, I'll share a horror story um, uh, with you. There's a, a, a lady in my church, her son is 25 years old, and um, he uh, got in trouble as a child and did some time in jail. Uh, he got out of jail, he, had a, he found himself a job, uh, moved in uh, with his girlfriend, uh, they had an argument, someone called the police, the police came, they searched the house, uh, there were, they arrested him, uh, he was put on hold, he lost his job. When they searched the home, there was a weapon in the home uh, and so his uh, public defender came to him and said, hey, I'm going to give you an option. You can plead guilty and, um, and, or, and get nine months. That's the deal on the table. Uh, or we can take this to trial. He said, I never touched her. We never had a fight. Um, I don't know what happened, but I, I'm not going to plead guilty. I'm not going to do time for something that I did not do. Uh, so he went to court. Uh, the original charge was dismissed. Uh, the assault charge was dismissed, but however, because the, the police went in and found two weapons in the house, uh, they decided to go an extra step, and they found not his fingerprints, but his DNA on the gun. And now this young man is facing 25 years in jail. 25 years. Now, I, I want to go to Fox Lake and ask how many uh, white people are doing 25 years because your DNA was found on a weapon. Uh, but that won't solve the problem. But that's a horror story, that this young man uh, who could have done things differently, uh, who, who yes, should have known that there, he can't be in a home with a weapon and, and all of these things. Well, he doesn't remember touching it. Uh, but now, that young man has children uh, that he won't be able to support. And somehow, we have to get ahead of this. And we have to say <laughs> to the young person, don't sell weed on the side, because if you get in, in trouble, your sentence is going to be harsher than anybody else's, and it's going to ruin your life and the lives of the family that you are trying to support. But instead of doing that, here's a job, or here's an opportunity, or here's help in school. Um, uh, we have to get ahead of that problem, and no one group is going to be able to do that. We have to keep them away from you, uh, and, and that happens in, you know, that happens in homes, that happens in the community, uh, and, and, and it also, you can help with that. You can help with that, and we, our approaches um, will only work if we have the support from people like you. Uh, that, that see yourselves as partners with what's going on. You have to be aware of what's going on. You will hear stories, um, and if you're aware and engage uh, in this community uh, beyond your work schedule and really find out how, um, how it feels and, uh, to be a minority in Dane County, I think it will be tremendously helpful. And again, I want to say the same thing I started with. I want to thank you for the work that you are doing in our community, uh, the work you are doing in the schools, uh, the extra mile, the extra 10 miles that you are going uh, to to help somebody uh, that, that you, you don't have to help. So please keep up the good work. We need you. We need more people like you. I, I am not, I, I am mad, but there's an, an emotion that describes me more than mad. I am worried.
I'm worried about a generation that feels that they have no hope, that feels that no matter what they do, you know, when I was, my dad raised me, it's going to be harder for you, so work harder. But now we have a generation of people that are coming up that are saying, why try? And so as you interact with, uh, with our children, uh, please do me a favor and put a little hope in their mind, even though they're looking at horrible situations, even though they're homeless, even though they've, they've been abused, even though uh, they don't have re the relationships that many of us have, uh, you have to be part of their family. And whether you interact with them for one minute, for one month, or uh, for their entire childhood, uh, you can be the difference maker. So thank you again for all you're doing. All right. I'd like to say thank you to Bishop Rayford for doing such a wonderful job of um, moderating um, the panel. I would also like to say thank you to Matthew Bronjan, um, Andre Johnson, Michael Johnson, and Rachel Krinsky for taking the time to be here today and talk about their different um, advocacy styles. By no means is this, um, are these the only types of advocacy styles they are. I think there are many more. But I think maybe hopefully through their eyes you saw what advocacy looks like. It's, it's not easy, but it is necessary.